Awesome. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so again, for everyone on the call and continuing to jump on the call, welcome. Uh, welcome to the Glory Days a panel of former student athletes regarding their life, uh, but also sport activism as well. Uh, my name is Tim Bryson. I currently serve on the Black Alumni Council as a nas national at-large member. Um, I'm an alum of the University of South Carolina, class of 2016. I uh, currently work in athletics. I'm a former student athlete as well. And so I'm super, ha super glad, happy, super glad, and very grateful to be facilitating this panel with us uh, today. Uh, before we get started, uh, just a brief history on Black Alumni Council. Uh, so the council was founded in 1979, um, and the purpose was to recruit and identify a Black talent to come enroll at the University of South Carolina. Over the last 50 plus years, uh, of course, the purpose has evolved and has changed uh, to really fit the evolving needs of Black students and alum at the University of South Carolina. Um, as a result, we find ourselves here uh, on Thursday, February 25th, 2021, having a conversation about Black student athletes, right? About Black student athletes, Blackness, sport activism, social justice, racial justice, which is something I know back in 1979 was nothing that we ever could have thought been possible. I'm um, hosted by um, not just a university, but also an athletic department as well. Uh, so as we think about um, this panel, think about what's gonna be discussed today. Um, this panel will not be anything without our guests. And so I wanna allow our guests to take just a couple minutes, you know, one or two minutes and share more about who you are. Um, when you graduated from the University of South Carolina, the sports you played, if you played professionally afterwards, uh, tell us more about that experience. And then what are you currently doing um, in your career? Uh, so we'll start with Mo, uh, move to Don, and then end with Marcus. Well, I, I definitely appreciate the introduction. and um, Very excited to be here tonight. This conversation is so important um, that we keep exploring how we can ask you know, Black student athletes, uh, former student athletes, help the current student athletes and their activism, uh, and just in life in general. So uh, again, I'm looking forward to having this conversation um, throughout the, the next hour and a half. Um, but for me, I'm Mo Brown. Um, I'm originally from uh, Belton, South Carolina, B-Town. Um, and I claim Anderson as well, uh, LA, Little A. Um, so uh, that's, where I, that's where I'm from. I, uh, currently, currently, I'm in Fort Mill, South Carolina. I played football. Um, I was a wide receiver from 06 to 09 um, under Steve Spurrier. Um, graduated with a business degree in finance and marketing from the Moore School. Um, and currently, um, I actually just launched a consultant firm about three weeks ago, um, business consultant firm. And so uh, doing this entrepreneurial life right now. Awesome. Then move over to Don. Nice. Hi, everyone. Um, Tim, thank you so much for including me in this panel. I'm really happy to be here. Proud Gamecock. My name is Dawn Ellerby. I'm from Centralized of New York. That's on Long Island. For those of you who are not familiar with New York, um, I currently reside outside of Los Angeles and I'm a sports administrator. I still work in sports. I think it's been my whole life since I was about 14. So now I'm still working in sports at California State University in Northridge as Associate Athletics Director. I did track and field at the University of South Carolina. I graduated in 1996 um, to all my old school uh, folks out there, 1996. And um, my career after athletics, I competed for U um, Team USA track and field for from 97 to 2004. I was on the U.S. Olympic team in 2000 and made a few world championships teams between 97 and 2004. And I uh, love what I do working in college athletics. I get to talk with student athletes all the time and kind of it keeps me young and keeps me involved in the um, college athletics. So thanks for letting me be here tonight. Well, Delby, thank you, Don. And more to the Marcus. Well, first of all, thanks for um, this opportunity of having me, along with these great peers. Um, currently, I'm an eighth grade math and science teacher in Kennedy Road Middle School in Griffin, Georgia. It's right by my hometown, McDonough, Georgia. Um, thankfully, I was able to get a scholarship to the University of South Carolina, just like my peers, just like you guys. Um, I went to school 2014 to 2018. I was lucky to make it to the Final Four 2017. Um, I did go to grad school, got my master's in health information technology at USC, go Cox. And so, like I said before, I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak with you guys and talk about life and really just to, just to connect with you guys. So thank you. Well, Debbie, thank you to Marcus. Uh, then our final guest, Elena Coates, uh, she'll be jumping on uh, hopefully in a little bit. I know she's currently competing overseas and still working on a different time zone. Um, but before we jump straight into our questions, I want to uh, first uh, center and really ground us in the fact that this is not normal. Uh, we, this, this conversation is not normal. This conversation is something that um, has really emerged over the last year with the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement um, last summer. Uh, but more specifically, we've seen uh, since last summer and really into this past fall, 
a lot of focus and conversation about the current status, the current experience of the black student athlete on our college campuses and universities. Uh, seldom have we heard uh, publicly, right? Uh, and I've heard through an alumni council, the experiences and the perspective from black alumni, black student athlete alumni. Um, so we're super, again, glad that we're having this conversation. I want to reiterate that this is a community conversation. And so though you know, I have questions that I'll definitely be asking you all over the next uh, several minutes, I want to also ask people on the call, if you have questions for our panelists, uh, please put them in the chat, uh, please send them to me and we'll be sure to answer them, answer them uh, on the call today. Um, so with that, we'll start with Don with this first question. And so thinking about what it means to be a student athlete. And again, you mentioned you currently work in sports and so your experience and perspective is super uh, important as well. But what did activism and speaking up, up about racial injustice mean to you when you were a current student athlete uh, back at South Carolina? And how have you seen that evolve over the last several years? I mean, your role as an athletics administrator. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I think that um, activism is different for everyone. I know when I was a student athlete at South Carolina, the climate was a little different. And I think that when you are an athlete, you actually are in a bubble. You know, you go from being an athlete in high school to being in college and where else, you know, the bubble to me is no matter your socioeconomic, your, finance, your financial background, your race, your nationality, your culture, everyone on your team is fighting for the same goal. Everyone just wants to win. And there's very few spaces that you get to do that where you have people from different backgrounds um, working together for the same goal every day, all the time. When you go to practice, when you go to the dining tables, when you go to the training room, everyone is doing the same thing, working to win. I think once you get out, out of that bubble is when you really realize your voice and how you can change, change things in your current community. So activism for me is more one-on-one -on -one conversations than it is um, going to march or being part of, of the larger um, view. I have, I'm able to get into areas where I can have conversations with people one-on-one. -on -one. I can have conversations with athletic directors one-on-one, -on -one, with presidents one-on-one -on -one to talk about what's going on in athletics, why we need change, and why we need to advance the movement for diversity and inclusion. So I think the activism is different for everyone and uh, what they're doing in their current lifetime, in their current lifestyle. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that perspective up, perspective up, Don. I'm gonna pass to Mo uh, to get his experience because again, we hear this conversation about we're one team, right? It's one mission, we're one family. In a lot of ways that can suppress a lot of the identities that makes us different, but also lists right. the experiences we have that are different on college campuses. Uh, so Mo, you're part of the football team, about hundred plus uh, members on that team. How have you seen activism evolve since you were on the team at South Carolina? But also what are some things you wish you had done when you're a current student athlete given I'm sure you've seen things that you want to speak up about as an athlete? Well, well, I definitely appreciate that question. And I was always that person who never had an issue with speaking up on things that I believe in. Um, and, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a family uh, trait, I guess you can say. Um, but during the time that I was going through USC, um, it was definitely a different climate than it is right now. Um, in fact, uh, I came in 06, 08, Obama was elected. So those first year and a half, you know, here as a black man, me as a black man, seeing this black man trying to obtain the highest office in the land was a lot of excitement around that, a lot of uh, confidence that came from it. And I still remember the day that he won. I was uh, in the East Quads and watching the results come in and I ran out of my uh, uh, dorm and I was just yelling up and down the hallway. But equally, there were white folks that was in the hall that was crying. So it was just an interesting dynamic that we grew up in. And so um, my activism was actually around just being breaking the mold of what a football player is and how we can achieve um, for the net beyond just the football field. Um, you know, I thought I was going to be a three year guy, be out, um, didn't work out that way. But my mom, you know, instilled in me the ports of education. And when I actually went into the university, I was admitted into the business school. The uh, then uh, academic, uh, my academic advisor that was from the uh, sports side looked at my schedule literally made me undeclared and um, I started taking the mu music appreciation no nope, no offense to music appreciation but you know looking at a black man looking at the curriculum that came with being um, excuse me came along with the business school mm -hmm. um, he looked at me and said I couldn't do the work so I had to go and apply for that two years later, in which I ended up becoming a business school major and obviously getting a finance and marketing degree. So you had to fight through that perception issue. And so that's what I took up on, took up. Um, and what was clear to me that one, I had to take my academics seriously, um, but more importantly, I had to be present, you know, understanding that the, the one to four to five years that I had to use a platform of being a USC football player 
and the connections and the people that you get to see, whether that was in community service, whether that was doing uh, autograph signing, um, how could I curve the mindset of what a student athlete was particularly a football player was something that I was always conscious of. So I participated in SAC. Um, I was, um, uh, I don't know how many different community service. Matter of fact, I got the Brad Smith uh, Community Service Award uh, just to be present. And as I did that, I met more people. And when I finished up, I had an opportunity to, be, to join the Board of Visitors um, at the University of South Carolina. And that opened up a whole lot more doors. So the activism was different. I was trying to break through the mold and cut through what people perceive student athletes to be, particularly football players. Um, but as it has evolved, I love the fact that USC is given a platform um, to deal with the social issues that we have now from President Caslin to uh, A.D. Tanner um, and all the initiatives that get put in place. It is a fantastic platform for student athletes to use um, their voices and they give them, give them the opportunity to do it. So uh, kudos to what's going on, kudos to this conversation. I definitely, uh, definitely would co-sign that. But to Marcus, again, we hear this not just locally, not just conference, but nationally, right? That coaches are continuing to suppress student athletes' voice, right? There's a limit yeah. of what, what they're able to say publicly versus privately. And again, you have that experience being a student athlete, but also on the coaching side as well. So talk to us more about uh, that, that experience and perspective. Uh, first of all, I do want to say this on the student side before I go into coaching. I don't, back then, I'm kind of fairly new, so I'm, I'm just fresh out of college. But as a young athlete, you know, being around other student, student athletes, especially at the Doty, just at the other athletic events, I feel like we always put ourselves in a bubble that Don had mentioned. Like, we, we truly didn't understand the power that we, we obtained as student athletes in college. And so for, um... I'm, I'm, no, I'm kind of sorry for all the events that happened within the world, but I think I feel like everything was needed because it gave us a platform for athletes to stand up and to fight for our rights, if that makes sense. And so for us college students, now we already been through it, me, Mo, Don, you, we already been through it. And for, the, for this to happen and for the college students to be able to take advantage of the platform now to speak up. Like the football team went on a march not too long ago. I think that was big time. I think that showed a representation of how strong athletes really are. Because at the end of the day, people do look up to us, but we don't realize it. Because the athletes, we look at it, okay, I'm just trying to play this sport and then go pro, if that makes sense. All right, so most athletes I know are one-minded, but to see, to see that athletes around the world, especially in the NBA, track and field, football, to stand up, to make tweets, to nationally promote our justice, right, our justice, and the fight, the injustice that's going on in this world, I feel like student athletes just need to continue uh, making improvements on our platform, if that makes sense, to keep fighting for what's right. Because I know as a young athlete, I, I never I never thought how athletes thought now. I always thought, okay, just let me go to practice. Let me get practice over with. Let me go to the Doty. Let me do my um my homework. Let mm -hmm. me try to make good grades. Just let me have let's have make uh have make a couple friends. You know what I mean? And for this to happen in the world and for athletes to go on the march, especially the football team, I greatly apprehend on um, the football team for doing that. And for the basketball team, especially Frank Martin, for speaking as a Latino as well, not just black, it's also Latino that's having to fight the injustice that's going on in our world. And it just, it just, it just means a lot. And then as a coach, as because I coach on um, Little Joe High School basketball team, I make sure that my kids, they speak up, but do it in the right way, if that makes sense. I don't, I don't want my kids to bring more negative, to bring more negative effects onto their lives. Because not too long ago, uh, a player of mine got shot, mm. which is sad, because he's only 16. And you know, he was he was shot by a white man because you know the whole Trump deal went on and you know Biden won. So it was a random, it was a random dude going on the street. Uh, we just left practice. He pulled up to his car. And so my student, well, my student athlete, he got out of his car, 
started running and the man kind of chased him and shot him in the leg. And you know, and so that's why I meant to say that just in general, I just hope that students, student athletes, they take advantage of that platform, but don't bring on more negative, more negative, you know, you know, um, brandings to yourself. You know what I mean? So that's really all I got to say. No, that's an interesting point. I'm gonna pass it back to Don for this because we hear the right way. What yeah, is we the right? We, we talking about activism. We talking about social justice. Yeah, you know, marching. Don, what's the right way? You know, from your perspective, from your experience, what's the right way? Well, I, I think the right way for me is what I talk, touched on before. And I'll give you an example. I had a, a man call me. Um, he was actually interviewing with me for a position. And he asked me, he said, as a black female in athletics, I need you to tell me what I can do. He was a, a white male. He said, I need you to tell me what I can do to help make a difference. I know you're going through it. I know you're hurting right now. Um, and another thing for us that are working in athletics, who are working in, sometimes in the business world, we're often the only one. I'm often the only black female in my office, the only person of color in the in the room, regardless of race, the only person of color in the room. So saying sometimes that those things weigh heavy on us, right? Um, thank God we all have broad shoulders, strong shoulders, right? But sometimes those things weigh heavy on us. And he asked me, what can I do to help? And I said, it's not always, yes, you can support, I support this group. He said, I support that group, this women's group, this, um, his, this Hispanic Latino group, this black group. I said, sometimes it's not about that because those people are all in the fight together. You know, I said, you have the privilege of being a Caucasian male and you can get into rooms that I can't get into. They just won't let me in, right? Mm -hmm. I just can't get into. And you can have those conversations with people that can help change one mind, one household, one community at a time. I think that's how we can make change at the grassroots level. And he said to me, I just don't like speaking to people who are bigoted or who have racist views. And I said, well, if you're talking to me, it, it doesn't make any difference. We have the same views. I said, that's where you can use your privilege to get into those spaces and hopefully change some minds of the CEOs, the hiring managers, the people who are making decisions that will directly affect Black um, athletes and Black people in general and all people of color. So I think everyone has their own right way. So mine is, if you ask me a question, be prepared for the answer. That's my right way. I don't want to retweet that. Before we go, before we go any further, this conversation warming up, and I love it. But I see Elena just jumped on. So Elena, if you want, don't mind, just taking a couple minutes and introducing yourself. So, uh, sports you play, what you're currently doing. Uh, just give us a little background about yourself, Elena. Okay. Can you hear me? Oh, oh, hi. Okay. So, uh, my name is Elena Coates. I play basketball. I played at USC for four years, and now I professionally play. I'm actually currently in Israel as we speak, um, and we won today, so it's always great news. Um, but yeah, just just out here, you know, trying to get through the every days of navigating through Israel and you know dealing with COVID. So, most definitely, thank you again, Elaine. I'm gonna pass it to you uh, after I ask this next question to Mo. I see he's ready to speak, and so. Can, can I, I just want to add one thing about doing Go ahead. Go ahead. That question is such a good question. Yep. Um, and this is something that I spend a lot of time uh, working on. <laughs> First off, be the change you want to see. And I know that's cliche. Obama put that there. But it's no reason to uh, change that saying because that is literally what it is. Um, and so when you're outraged, first off, breathe. You know, don't don't ever act off emotion in the moment. You know, all, always compose yourself. And as student athletes, we all understand that. You know, we 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 constantly are under pressure and having to be self-aware and correcting, as yeah. I call it. Whether that's the film, whether that's your coach, whether it's your teammate, whether it's your classmate, whether it's your family, whether that's the community, whether that's whomever. You know, we have to be so self-aware and correcting. So we know how to compartmentalize, plan be strategic about how we're gonna go about um, bringing the change that we wanna see. So first breathe, but then educate yourself. What is the issue you have? What are the resources that you have at your disposal to be able to make the changes that you can? And, and a lot of times it's just a simple Google search starting off. So do that first. And then once you find out those, the, that information, you have to be persistent and consistent about what about the change that you're looking to bring about. And if you're not going to do that, then you're just going to be a fly um, on the windshield and then you're going to be gone, right? So you got to continue, continuously 
um, push forward to the, the change that you want to be. And as for me, you know, I'm saying as a student athlete, challenged myself on um, the business side. Um, once I finished up, I stayed around USC, got on boards, um, Board of Visitors uh, Association, Association of Lettermen, um, the Young Alumni Board at the Moore School of Business. And I understand everybody can't do that, but you have to, have to be consistent, resourceful, and dedicated to the change that you want to get done. That's a great point. So to markets, how does that happen? Because again, the narrative in college athletics is that student athletes don't have any time outside of competition, classes, travel, rehab, sleep, try to maybe eat. So how does that happen? How does someone become resourceful? How does someone find the time, create the time, identify the resources on campus within the community to be the change they need to be and want to be? I will, I will say this. It, it, it is pretty hard to actually find the time because, you know, you wake up, got to lift weights, then you got to you gotta go through actual practice, and then you got school, then you got the study hall, and then you got to you gotta make sure you get to sleep. But then at nighttime, you got to make sure you get the extra work. You know what I'm saying? So in season, I do, I do, I do understand that it's pretty hard to find the time, but outside of season, just when you should really take advantage of the free time that you're given to make the most of the opportunity that you're given. Because to be honest, to be an athlete at USC, at the University of South Carolina, is, is so many great opportunities, great privileges you can take advantage of. There's so many great connects you can go to as far as connecting with Tanner, connecting with, uh, like myself, I connected with past CDs, who came a good friend, and especially Doty Academic Center, who always got your back. So outside the season, I would say to really, to really take advantage of the free time in the off season, to really get the familiar familiarize yourself with the leaders of the campus, you know, and, and all departments. All right, not just the, not just athletic departments, but the student athletes need to, to really realize like. They're bigger than what they think they are. It's bigger than just a game, all right? Because you, you're fighting, cause you plan for us, but you, you, you really plan for the whole world, to be honest with you. You know what I mean? And so that's, and like I said before, man, you just got to, and all things, you got to take advantage of the time, especially at USC, to really connect yourself with the leaders in every department that's on campus, all right? And then during the season, when you got that day off, take care of your body. And then as you take care of your bodies, go go in, go and make connections. Go to the um what's it called? Russell House still. Go to go to right, go right, to yeah. Russell. Yeah, go to Russell House. Stand, um connect with people that be at the booth that making um that's making sexual awareness um known. That's 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 making people as at the booth that's talking about the black rights, you know what I'm saying? Like make yourself, like familiarize yourself with people like, like small people like that, that's at the booth. That's how I say to take advantage of your time, even during the off season. That's a good point. So I'm gonna transition us a little bit uh, to Elena. And so we mentioned before, right? There's a responsibility um, as a student, at, well, the, the perceived responsibility as a student athlete, you know, it's a privilege to be a student athlete at a you know SEC school, especially the University of South Carolina. Um, but Elena, you know, did you feel any pressure to, you know, represent the university in any way, or even as a professional athlete, do you feel any pressure, really perceived, to represent your professional team in a certain way? And how does that then influence how you engage in activism? Um, I mean, I've always felt that way, but in terms of like proceeding to go about uh, speaking up on like activism, whether it be going on marches, you know, getting petitions together, things like that. My teams are always like, they always support us in our individuality. So like say pretty much the whole team feels a certain way about like Black Lives Matter and one person doesn't. Like there's no divide, like everybody does things under a unified front. And I can say with Washington, I truly felt like I had like much more of a presence with my voice when it came to like speaking on activism. Um, you know, especially with the, the situation that happened with Jacob Blake and it, you know, the idea to, instead of wearing warm-up shirts, wear the um, shirts, spelling his name out with the seven bullet holes in the back, like, we have, the, it, it was amazing to me because I was like, I have 
the support and the backing of my organization to do this. Like I feel some type of way. I'm surrounded by other individuals that feel the same type of way. And this is a part of our activism. This is how, this is a part of us speaking out. Like that was one of the two days of games that we protested. And I just feel like there's a lot of freedom because, and there's not a lot of censorship. I really feel like it being USC, even though I wasn't there during those times or it being with Chicago or Atlanta, Minnesota, Seattle, it doesn't matter what the team is. The WNBA as a whole, like, wants to be a unified front and we are a unified front. So at the end of the day, we all stand in solidarity with the choices that we make, whether it's half of the teams in the league who did it, all 12, just one. And it's really supportive and it's very, it's a very supportive atmosphere. So you can come in with ideas, you can come in with ways to make things more known within us. Uh, you know, just you, it, you, you feel this sense of comfort comfortability because of it. And I really just feel like you're free to express yourself like verbally, politically, like, and at the end of the day, everybody understands that, well, obviously not everybody, but like just within the example, everybody understands that there may not be the same viewpoints, but we're not gonna hinder you from speaking passionately or doing things because of something that you passionately feel about. It's a really good point. I'm glad you uh, highlighted your professional uh, athlete example because Don, again, Elena mentioned this welcoming environment, the franchise supported what the, uh, what the athletes wanted to do. But in college athletics, is there a cap in what student athletes are able to do um, as student athletes as a part of the university? Mm -hmm. um, and if so, like, okay. what is that? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. You I do think that um, it depends on your university. It depends on the region where you live. And um, and that and that's a tough that's a tough on that's that's honest. It is depends yeah. on university where you live. And I think as a, as an athletics administrator, um, my student athletes come to me because I look like them and they need someone to talk to, someone that will understand what they're going through. At the same time, I'm managing to a um, senior level administration that doesn't look like me. They may not understand. So sometimes we battle between like, I don't want to rock the boat, but I have to provide a safe space for my student athletes where they can voice their opinion, where they can let things out and where they can be heard and organize themselves. So I think it really, unfortunately, it depends on the university that you're at, but I don't think anybody should be um, hushed or quieted from expressing how they feel in their feelings. I do agree with Tamarcus that you have to go about it depending on where you are, you may have to go about it in a certain way. You know, there's politics, and I don't mean like the actual presidents and governors and senators. I mean, on our level, there's politics that we have to navigate to kind of get our point across. Um, and that's not easy for everyone to do, and it's not easy on every campus. This is, yeah, I want to reiterate that people on the call have, um, have questions. Please put them in the chat. I want to make sure we get uh, to those questions as a community conversation. Uh, but Mo, you mentioned earlier education. I know you were on the, um, the clubhouse um, meeting, shout out to Lauren Harper and Secure the Ballot yesterday on civic engagement, right? And voter engagement. We did a lot of education on voter engagement, a lot of education on you know, why it's important to vote, but how can universities and more specifically athletic departments begin education on how to um, engage in student activism? You're muted, Mo. Um, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, the, the state house um, recently debated getting civics back into uh, schools. Uh, that needs to be a course. You know, educating right. individuals on not only how government functions, um, but the responsibility that we all have to ensure that it is functioning in a way that represents all of us. Um, right now, if we look at how uh, politics is is. Uh, laid out it comes from where the power is in the individual instead of the power that's in the people you know we anoint these folks in these mm -hmm. positions as they should be because they, they are representing they got a lot of uh power in their hand but honestly you know we're the checks and balance of that um and so if you don't understand all the levers that you can pull to make sure that your representation is getting heard or being being represented um then you're not doing your part as well. And so from a, a higher institution level, we need to make sure that we're equipping 
um, these students that's coming through, uh, whether that's on the elementary, I want to say elementary, probably middle school up, um, that they are understanding how the government work. And then once you have the information, it's up on us to make sure that we're you know, participating in our local elections, our state elections, our federal elections, particularly on the state side and the local side, because those uh, elections are going to affect your day to day every single day. Um, so you want to make sure that you're showing up to the board meetings, council meetings, understanding what govern governing they're putting over your life to ensure that you're being represented. So mm -hmm. schools get civics back in schools. We got to make sure that we're teaching it and there is a competency um, and knowing how that functions. And then it's on all of us at that point to make sure that we're doing our part to hold our elected leaders um, wherever they are on the scale uh, accountable to the needs and the representation that we want to see. That's well said. Elena, you know, what education you know, could athletic departments um, begin to facilitate and or the university begin to facilitate around uh, student activism? I'm sorry, could you uh, repeat it one more time? It was going no, in that, and out. No, you're fine. So what education uh, can the university and or athletic department begin to facilitate um, around student activism? Well, I think for starters, they can let it be known that it's okay to speak freely on things that you feel strongly about. Like, I can't remember how many like young ones like I've talked to that like I mentor and it's just like, I don't know, like, should I, should I do it? And it's not on some, I'm gonna do it because everybody else wants to do it. It's like, no, like I feel strongly about how black people are being treated. I'm, I feel strongly about the, the injustices within the you just like the system and everything. And I'm just like, do like, I really feel like first and foremost, they need to educate kids and let them know it is 100% fine to express yourself. Like, censors, like censoring yourself because of how you think society is going to see it or any of this other stuff, I personally feel like it's not cool. And you got to start with letting them be comfortable knowing that they can do these different things. And I guess it's like teaching different ways of like being, well, I don't know. I don't know, just kind of creating a like a positive environment to where like after of course you let it be known that they're in a safe space, they can come here to speak their minds about X, Y, Z and everything. You know, to like also get involved and show them like not only are you there to just be a listening ear, like you also care about their interests. And of course that helps with, you know, making the bonds and everything. But for sure, I definitely feel like making sure that they know it's okay you know, letting them be free in their creativity with the options that they have in terms of how they want to express their activism, you know, finding resources if they want to, well, letting them, like educating them on resources that they can, you know, reach out to if they want to, you know, make an even bigger noise than what they do now on campus, within the city, just things of that nature. Like, I feel like we have all these different resources and different ways to get in contact with people from these companies and then that this, that and the fourth. And I feel like we can do the same when it comes to activism. Extremely well said. And so to Marcus, again, we keep mentioning this word education, environment, and I love your perspective of being both a former student athlete and a current coach, um, but also an assistant coach at the University of South Carolina. So how do, how can coaches, how you, how have you as a coach um, created an environment where student athletes and your students and even at the high school can feel comfortable to speak up and use their voice? Uh, to be honest, to create a comfortable environment is it's been kind of hard because the whole COVID thing. So, I mean, we, we really, it's not really an environment, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, all we're doing is we're gathering up at the gym, we're going through practice, and then we're going home. So, it's not an environment where we're in school and where you can see other races in school. And you know, when it comes to those arguments, those disputes on how to defend yourself, the kid, my kids are not put in that situation in order to defend what's right on what, on what they think is right and what's wrong, if that makes sense. So to be honest, to answer that question, is this, we, it's not really the environment in order to make a comfortable environment on, on what's right and wrong, if that makes sense. So you're saying with that. And so I'm going to bring up a question from one of the um, community members. I'll start with Mo. This relates to exactly what you're talking about to Marcus. 
Um, and the question right. is, in college, uh, do you believe your coaches were supportive of activism or participating in activism themselves? If so, why or why not? And I'll allow you to answer that with whatever capacity. Um, you know, again, during my time, it wasn't a ton that was going on. Um, a lot of our issues were was internally, you know, trying to figure out how we was going to win games. Um, and, you know, you got to go to study hall, things of that nature. Um, but generally speaking, I would say Coach Burry was always open to our positions and our, talk, uh, and our stances, um, particularly if you can articulate it in a way that, you know, he can follow. I, I give him credit for being a pretty fair man when it comes to things of that, that nature. But I will say that overall, you know, it was, it, it was always difficult because of all the reasons that we know, you know, the, the whole shut up and dribble, the mentality that comes along with that, you know, picking your battles that you're going to be able to go down that road. Because honestly, we always had to think about playing time, unless you was Alshon Jeffrey or Sidney Rice or things of that nature, because you're competing against uh, highly talented people coming all from over the country to, to participate in whatever sports you're in. And so you got to make business decisions, right? You know, am I going to take this on? Um, and it may prevent me from being on the field because the thing is the coaches have feelings too. And if you're bringing more stress to their life, that could possibly turn into you not being on the field. And so as student athletes trying to figure that out, um, I wouldn't say that we felt comfortable making decisions that did not uh, affect our playing time on the field um, versus us going out and being act, being activists. So um, again, I was kind of an anomaly and I, I won't go into all of my stories about how I was affected specifically because of my stances, um, but it, it, it definitely had an effect that I did not walk away from issues that I felt strongly about. You warming us up. I'm gonna uh, allow Don to answer this question before I turn it up a little bit more. Uh, but Don, were your coaches supportive of activism? Uh, did they participate themselves? And if so, why or why not? Well, I think I think that our coaches were supportive of what, what we wanted to do and what we had to say. Like most said, it was a different time in the 90s. There wasn't the, we weren't in a pandemic. There wasn't the social injustice happening. We didn't have social media. So we didn't have, it wasn't as visible, right? It was, uh, it was kind of personal. And it, so it wasn't as visible as it is today. So I think what happened, I think, we can all agree that as leaders on the team, even if you're on the team, if you become a team captain, or if you're um, you're one of the more vocal or maybe more um, accomplished athletes on the team, you get a certain conversation with the coach. You have a certain um, degree of comfortability with that coach, right? Because you're one of the best athletes, and they know that. So you could have a different a different conversation. You have a different relationship. And I think my teammates often use me if they had a problem. Now the activism might not be a social justice issue. But if it was a practice time, if they wanted to change a uniform, that they didn't want a certain meet they wanted to go to in the track and field, they always use me to speak to our coaches. So I think that has set me up from a student athlete to now um, athletics administrator to help my student athletes kind of navigate how they can speak to their coaches. And we try to create at CSUN, where I work right now, a very open environment where student athletes feel comfortable speaking their voice and coming to the people that they feel comfortable with and then we taking it up to the next level. So I think that set me, being a team leader on my team at South Carolina really set me up for the position that I'm in right now. So I don't think my coaches at the time had much to tell me, um, to advise me one way or the other as far as like social injustice and activism when I was in college. I appreciate that, Don. Uh, Elena. Uh, how was your coach uh, supportive of activism or participated in activism themselves? I mean, if so, why or why not? Um, well, you know, we didn't really have much like, there wasn't like a huge uproar in terms of like activism, especially when I was like still at USC. But even though I've never had, I was never in those like situations while technically under Coach Daly's care, I always got the vibe that if anything was to ever go down, like she would be one of the ones in the street. She would be one of the ones holding something on campus, like for whatever is going on, because she's just one of those people. And even though it's kind of hard with the time difference to like catch games and, you know, catch up on all the, the reports and everything, I do remember seeing how she stands by, like she stands behind her girls whether they kneel or sit and or stand during the national anthem, 
she's set in like how she feels about everything and she's entitled to feel that way just like everybody's entitled to their opinion and whether her girls want to kneel or they want to stand she stands behind them 100 percent and I love that about Coach Daly because you could comfortably be yourself. It didn't matter which aspect or which area it was that you were doing it in, like whether it be on the court, off the court, politically, any other kind of way. Like she always had your back. So I always felt like she was definitely somebody who, I mean, Coach Daly just gives off down for the cause vibes. So. So, 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 so Lena, you're saying that it's important to have black head coaches uh, yes. I mean, I mean, we love a good black head coach, but I do feel like, you know, in head coaching positions, like it's going to be really great for like the younger generations. If, you know, they be like, well, who do you want to be like when you go up? Who do you want to look up to? And they can say a black head coach, whether basketball, football, soccer, lacrosse, you know, someone's always aspiring to be in those situations like that and little kids always want to be able to be like oh that's my hero this person is this and this this person is that so I do feel like having more black head coaches at that is you know tremendous Especially I think we can all, uh, retweet a thousand percent and I think we can all agree to black head coaches black women head coaches um we need a lot, lot more a lot more of them uh, in college sport and professional athletics uh, but to Mo, your point earlier right college sport is very bureaucratic I and mean, that's what it is that's, that's that's where we are right now so a question from Risa in the chat um, is that oftentimes it seems as if the leaders in athletics don't want to stand firm on the injustices in our country and allowing student athletes to voice their opinions because of donors. I'm glad we're bringing this up. At what point does the care of the student athlete outweigh the money from the donors? Uh, well, so we'll start with Mo, go to Don, and then to Marcus. You know, that, that is a very good question, right? Because, I mean, you're talking about the business of yep. the school and you're looking at it from two different ways. You got the student athlete, um, if you are in a money making sport, that's bringing significant money into it. If you know your football, 100 plus million of revenue comes through the football program every single year that is largely generated by the student athletes that is you know, drawing people to it and everything that's evolving around the student athletes in general, right? Um, so there's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it, a lot of that money coming from those donors who are writing these, you know, five, six, seven, eight figure checks to make sure that these facilities are up to recruit these top end uh, recruits that you want to see here. Um, as a business person, you have to make a decision. Um, and 2021, it's much easier to make those decisions uh, for the student athlete and give them the platform that they had prior to it was prior to 2020, summer 2020. So I think moving forward, that decision between donors standing on um, standing on um, uh, activism and social injustice and things of that nature will have to fall in line with the student athletes because you're seeing it and throughout the whole culture. Right. Whether that's in corporate America, whether that's in government, um, whether that's in higher education, interest, higher education, all those institutions are are forcing d diversity and inclusion to be a staple of what they're trying to get done in their objective. So I think moving forward, um, we'll see a better blend of that. But um, in the past, it definitely has been a struggle because at the end of the day, you know, people who cut and check who's paying you usually going to be able to dictate the, 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 the decisions that you're making. Um, so it has been an issue, but what we've done seen from how we, uh, collaborate and we're partnering and we actually put plans in place and show that our strength in numbers cannot weigh those dollars because at the end of the day it's about getting the best student athletes in the door and if now these conscious um, gen z folks who's looking at all the issues um, along with the ability to play if you're not in line as a university to recruit these folks you're going to miss out on the uh, the really good recruits that you can possibly get. So it's a lining up for that not to be an issue, but in the past, it definitely, definitely can be the case. Look, that's an interesting point. I'm going to uh, turn to Don because again, we, we, we've heard business decisions, the business enterprise, college athletics is a business, but then in their mission statement, student athlete and students are in all caps, right? Mm -hmm. So Don, at what point does the care of the student outweigh fundraising dollars? 
Um, I agree with Mo, it's easier now to do that than it has been in the past. And we think of college athletics as a business. And sometimes we get a little bit ahead of ourselves in this business because what we are doing is we are influencing the leaders of, the, of tomorrow. And we're basically doing that every day we're working with students. And I consider myself a servant leader, right? So I'm here because the student athletes are here. The university is standing because there's students here. And when you look at the big picture, you can have a million dollar donor that says, I don't want to, I'm gonna stop giving you my money if the student athletes do A, B, C, or D. And then that, that goes to, well, how does, that, how does that one donor affect my student athlete, my team, my coaches, my whole administration, and then the whole university? So we're seen as buckling to something that's right and letting our students have a voice is what we're supposed to be teaching them anyway because of one donor. That affects the image and the visibility of the entire university. So I think we have to start thinking of it on the, on the athletics is the front porch of the university. Everyone knows that. We have to think of it as how our decisions impact our student athletes, coaches, administrators, and the entire university. I think when you think of it that way, um, you can, as we, as we all progress, hopefully, to be more diverse and inclusive, you will find donors that value diversity and inclusion. And it's your job as an athletics director or an administrator to get out in the community and talk to people and let them know what you're doing. You may have to take a hit now, but if you go down 20, 30 years later, you have to think about the legacy that you're building for your department and for the university. See, I would agree with that, Don. And I think a lot more donors than we, than we know, you know, are buying, starting to buy diversity and inclusion a lot more. But this is equity and social justice piece, right? And that's not easy, but, but can, you know, it's not easy, but... Justice piece. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, equi the equity is a big point. Um, I would say corporate America is ahead of a lot of folks when it comes to the equity. You're seeing folks like Netflix, uh, Wells Fargo just invested in um, the bank in Columbia. I think it was uh, $10 million. I may be incorrect on that number. But you're seeing corporate responsibility in the DNI space to deal with the equity gap. Now, when you start talking about donors on the student athlete, particularly in the Southeast, where your traditional donors are conservative in nature, um, let's just call it like it is, you are running up against that equity part. Like, why do we need to give away more money? But the, the, the reality of it, and to Don's part, is when it's not a zero sum game. If you uh, really pull people who's pulling in a direction that not only society is pulling, but as a higher, higher uh, education institution, we supposed to lead the way on social issues and then we're behind. We're gonna, you know what we're not gonna do? Get those recruits in and you know who's gonna be upset? Those donors, because we're not winning. So it all plays together, it's holistic, starting with the student athlete at the center. How do we make their experience the best that, that one to five years that they're potentially there? And then afterwards, how are we building a culture and a system that supports them getting jobs and also being active in their community and help run these great companies that's around Columbia and all across the world, literally. And it all plays together to a winning culture where everyone's going to be happy when we, what, win it. So it makes sense on all levels to go this direction. No, I love hey, Don, this quick, Don, oh, go quick ahead, question. Yep, go ahead. I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. Since you work with leaders of student athletes, do you think those leaders try to avoid the negative attention? If that makes sense? Like, do they try to avoid the negative outcome that can happen from if a, a student athlete was to make certain comments that donors and other people can find negative? Like, do leaders try to avoid those events from happening? Is that why we kind of yeah. make those choices of trying to please the donors instead of the student athletes? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think even okay. even I'll speak for myself. I don't yeah. want to. I don't want anyone to be upset with me, but I also exactly. have a responsibility to the student athletes that I serve. Right. So yes, it's really hard. You, you cringe sometimes every time you give a student athlete, like you're giving a 19 year old a platform with your whole, with their whole team and whole department. Of course you cringe, but you have to get it back to like, um, it's our job to shape and help them grow and to, you know, um, contributing members of society. And this is what's gonna help them. And I think they, the more that an athlete is able to speak out and then grow in that confidence, the more um, responsibility it will take of the team too. 
So if you see like a student athlete's really, really upset about something and they speak out about it and you support them, then you have to reel them in, not reel them in, I don't want to say that. You have to kind of massage the situation a little bit and help them do it in a tactful way. You know, but the more they're able to speak out, the confidence grows and they become leader to the team. And then everyone kind of buys into that. And if you're doing the right thing and everyone's buying into it, you just have to take your hits when it comes to the donors and stuff like that, because there are going to be donors that believe in what you're doing. You know, and as we grow as a society and these social issues become more prominent and a solution becomes the goal there will be donors that will help you. But absolutely, I, um, I work with my coaches. I hope that they understand that they can let the student athletes um, speak out. But like anything else, it doesn't have to be a social issue. Sometimes we have situations where there might be um, um, an incident on campus where alcohol is involved. There might be a sexual assault on campus. There might be some kind of fight that has nothing to do with race on campus. And all those things are really hard to deal with as a leader. When you're dealing with young people, you want to give them enough space to grow, but you also want them to act and have some sense. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> <laughs> I, I was wondering, because you in a tough position, because you trying to deal with both sides on how to accommodate the student athletes and accommodate the leaders. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I, I found that pretty hard. I was, that was a good question, though. No, so, Elena, again, just to round this out, you know, we've heard college athletics is a business. So in a lot of ways, we know student athletes are uh, employees, which that could be another panel for another, next week. But how do you then balance, to Mo's point, the least this blend between employee, or right, part of this business enterprise, but then also the, the college student experience as well? What does that balance look like as a current athlete? Uh, I mean, it's just, it's hard, but I mean, I've always been, I mean, ironically enough, I've always been the one to just be like, I don't really necessarily believe in like paying college athletes mm -hmm. simply because I've just always had the viewpoint of you're supposed to work hard enough. And I guess like when you're in college, you're supposed to receive the knowledge and the training the, as much as you can so that you can get paid to do this in real life. So I feel like in terms of like trying to like balance that whole situation, like with student athletes and like paying and like with the business and all that other stuff, it's just always going to be a big mess because then you have to look into who's selling how much of what, and there's all these like logistics and everything. I just feel like People want student athletes to get paid so bad, but how are they going to do it equally and like respectfully to do to like the player to the team? Because you know what I'm saying? Like someone who's maybe like the perfect six man, they could sell stuff. And then you got like the starter, like the star player, they sell stuff, they're the face of the team, all that stuff. Da -da -da -da. They both sell great numbers, but it's like are you still going to pay them the same wage? Because, you know, one of them sold like 10 times as much as the other one. So I kind of feel like in terms of like a balance, I guess, between the two, I, I personally just can't even imagine like what it would look like. I just feel like there's so many different like tactical factors that go into it that would make it fair. Like, I really feel like it wouldn't be a lot of fairness for, you know, teams, individuals, you know, I just feel like we should just leave money out of college sports and just leave it to, you know, earning our degrees and student athletes, you know, working as hard as we can. If we want to go to the next level, to getting to the next level and achieving and, you know, doing things like that, even if it's not playing a professional sport, like just achieving the highest that you can get in the field that you want to be in. I appreciate that. Respect. So I, that's just personally how I feel. I uh, appreciate that. Tamarga, see, see you was nodding your head a little bit. Any thoughts on what Elena yeah. just, just uh, shared? Man, I always thought that subject was kind of it's kind of iffy because it can it can go either way. So like as far as paying athletes, I thought, you know, due to myself, I came from a good background. So I came to school uh, on a scholarship. So they provided me with meals. They provided me with a little uh, stipends and whatnot, and I was good to live off of it. So, I, so personally, I'm thinking, okay, you might ne not necessarily need to get paid. Athletes don't need to get paid. But then you got those athletes who don't come from, you know, the same background as me that come from a less fortunate, from a less fortunate background. So they, so they need more, if that makes sense. 
So when you're in need more, you feel like, okay, man, this ain't this ain't cutting it. All right. You find yourself just playing and you barely living off of it because you can't ask your people back home for more money, if that makes sense. So now you find yourself, okay, oh man, I need more money. I gotta take care of my people back home, but I can't do it because I'm at school trying to trying to play ball. And so I just feel like that 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 area it can go it can go so many ways. And then as far as I heard something about players again, um, players getting paid off it likely. So like, I don't know, man. I just it, that's a, that's a tough subject, man. Cause it can go either way. Cause you can have different types of feelings for it, if that makes sense. Like, because personally, I thought I had it good, and I felt like okay. Players probably don't need to get paid. But then you got those, like I said before, who came from a, a less fortunate background who actually need more money, like who actually still struggling with the little money that they do get because they don't got no extra support out, outside of that. You know what I mean? And so as far as that subject, man, it just it ain't go so many ways. See, Molly, go ahead. Uh, you know, this this right here, um, I can I can talk at not at nauseum about why athletes should get paid. But what I'm going to do, because um, like you said, this is a, a whole panel in and of itself. Um, I I'm going to encourage everyone to um, go to Cory Booker's page and look up the athletes bill of rights. Um, there is legislation on the floor to deal with 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 um, athletes getting paid, health care, um, likeness, um, making sure that your rights are being protected um, as an adult that is bringing in revenue um, that you should not be able to, I mean, that you should be able to obtain based off who you are and the, the work that you're doing. So I would encourage everyone to go look at that legislation. That is a framework of what it could potentially look like for athletes getting paid. Me personally, I think they should. Um, you know, it's nowhere in American society if you're bringing in revenue and you're doing it at a, a level that um, you're doing on, on college, particularly in the SEC, if you're playing in football, playing basketball, those revenue generation generating sports, to go through three to five years, um, get injured, give your body, and then when you finish up, you know, half the time don't have the jobs, don't have the right uh, degree because the focus is whatever your sport is. And on the athlete, at the academic side, um, you're not getting the support and the uh, connections needed to, to really thrive on the back end. So if you're gonna tell you're not gonna pay us, you damn sure, and I don't know if I can say that, but I said it, uh, need to make sure that these athletes are set um, um, as they go into their the next phase of their career. And, and as we know, too often student athletes are not, you know, they go back home when they finish, they have a degree, they have a degree that they can't really do much with, um, they don't have the right connection to take them to the next level or even start their career. And so there's a lot of incompleteness to this, this, this equation that needs to be addressed. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I, you know, know what, ahead, to piggyback please. off of that, to piggyback off of that, I, uh, I think the problem is students, there's some student athletes who are, who are just blind to the fact that they deserve, they do deserve more money, like they deserve to get paid. And like, as for myself, I think I was one of them because I think I came to college thinking I was, I was good. You know, so I, didn't, I wasn't looking at, I wasn't looking at it as, me giving up my body every day, me looking at it as I'm bringing in the revenue. I saw it as, as most students, I think, I think they saw it, see it as, okay, I'm coming to play ball, which I love to do. And with most saying that, I think that that's, that's actually a good point. Cause I think a lot of students come in thinking like I do. Okay, I'm just, I'm, I can play ball, for, I can play ball for free. What's gonna help me go pro, you know what I mean? But they're not, they're not, they're not realizing those are the ones who are bringing in the revenue, who are bringing in, I mean, who like, who really, I mean, potentially about to break their bodies like I did, like I broke my hip, you know what I'm saying? And just, I'm glad Mo said it. What you said his name was, Corey? Corey Booker, Senator Corey Booker. Corey it's, Booker. It's, it's, it's a, it's a uh, athlete's bill of rights. It's like athletes build the rights. Athletes I'm glad you said that because you changed my perspective. Yeah. And I think and I think that's how a lot of other student athletes think mm -hmm. too as well. 
Just read up on it. That, 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 yeah. that is, Tim, we can bring that panel back. And I'm going to stop the, I'm gonna stop NIL right now. That's a whole retreat, like a weekend long, month long retreat. But <laughs> oh. in the same vein, I do, I'm glad it got brought up. One, because it's, it's timely and relevant. But two, there could potentially be, and there may actually be, student athletes organizing uh, to influence state government uh, to get bills like the State Bill of Rights passed, student athlete Bill of Rights passed within their state. Um, so we'll start with Elena. Um, this is a question from Rick Wade uh, around this topic as well. But thinking about life after college, life after competition, uh, should an undergraduate student athlete or graduate student athlete be concerned with how their activism would influence their ability to make it to the pros as a professional athlete, uh, get a job and or start a business? As much as I want to say yo, no, I have to be realistic and say yes. Like at the end of the day, like some workplaces, they just care too much about that, but in the wrong way. They don't want, they want to be considered like neutral or they don't want to be seen as supporting one thing for, you know, whatever reasons. Um, I can say with like organizations, like many of the professional sports, like I feel like it's easy, like you can just come in and do whatever, well not do whatever, but like be who you want, be do like live how you live, feel how you feel, your opinions are your opinions, whatever you follow politically, follow politically, everything else in life. And I feel like sometimes in some situations, you you kind of have to censor yourself. Like there was the situation the night that, um, the night that we had protested the uh, or boycotted the games, I guess, whatever you would call it, when we didn't play because of the Jacob Blake situation, a lot of people like within the organization thought us not playing and just using the TV time to like have a, like force a conversation wasn't going to be the way to do it. And in a sense, like in that moment, I felt like we're getting censored because it's like national TV not saying anything at all. Like obviously trying to get your message heard on national TV during a good prime time, we're going to do that. Um, and there were a couple of people inside that kind of was just like, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't um, boycott because da, da 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 and this, that, and the fourth. But at the end of the day, like, even though there's going to be that little majority that is going to think that way, I feel like people should put themselves in a position and in a workplace where they can be able to freely go about themselves, be able to speak their opinions without being attacked, be able to belong to a specific party that another might not, be able to be another skin color from somebody else and everything just be perfectly fine. Great point, Don. How, how do you help to educate student athletes on you know, their decision to engage in activism and how that may influence um, their careers outside of sport, after competition, excuse me. Now, we've talked about this a lot, and I think that um, you have to approach your career post-collegically the same way you approached it when you were going to college. You have to be very strategic. I'm sure when um, when I was when I was going to, when I was in high school, I was so happy to get a scholarship. I would have gone any place. Thank <laughs> God I wound up at the University of South Carolina. I think as students, um, young student athletes in high school and junior high school now are so much more savvy than I was, right? So they know the coach, they know the coach of the university, they know the logos and the stripes and where the university is and what city is and how the life is around that college campus. I think, so they make those decisions based on, am I gonna have a good coach, a good experience? Am I gonna get my education? And am I gonna be successful on the field, on the playing field of their choice? I think the same thing holds true when you get into a career. You know, even, even me, I, I amount to what I put on social media. My social media is all public. I monitor what I put on there because I don't want, you know, I say, if my dad can't see it, I don't post it, right? So that covers, if it covers daddy, it covers the president of a university, the AD for university, and all my colleagues too, right? So I think when you think about your career that way and you say, I want to work in so-and-so. So if I want to be, uh, if I'm, my major is political science, you have a different um, a different view. If it's mine is public relations and marketing, it's a different view. But if you want to work in a more conservative area, you have to think about strategically, what am I putting on my pages 
that's going to keep me from working in these places. And you can voice your opinion, but it has to be in the context of what you want to do. And they that could some, to some people seem like a cop out. But as we're progressing, if we if we're all um, if everyone's protesting and being active active in the same way, that's really hard to create change. So as I as I put it, I will put things on my own that I care deeply about Black Lives Matter. Um, Breonna Taylor, that affected me so personally. Mm -hmm. And those are things because I can look in the mirror and see her. And there's a lot of our colleagues that don't look like us, that don't have that same kind of kinship and community because they haven't had to. If I look at Tamargus, I look at Alana, I look at Mo, y'all could be my cousins. Like legitimately, we could be cousins, you know? And I think when things are happening, we look at things like that as black people when other people don't have to do that. So while I would love to say, post what you want, be out there what you want, I think you think of activism, while it's most important, just like anything else that you would do that could be looked at, you know, you wouldn't post a um, picture of you doing anything inappropriate and not that activism is inappropriate, but the way you express yourself, um, you have to take that in consideration, depending on the culture of the company that you want to work at. A great point. So, Mo, you mentioned a couple of experiences you had while at, uh, at South Carolina, and again, those could be, I'm sure, panels within themselves as well. Um, but, like, who was educating you? Who was in your, you know, in your circle? Uh, helping to, you know, give some either feedback or guidance, uh, quite frankly, in regards to how you move forward and make those decisions as an undergrad student athlete. You know, the uh, Maria Hickman, um, obviously, who is the assistant uh, academic, uh, excuse me, athletic director right now, and I go Maria, um, as well as Raymond Harris, um, Harrison, uh, who was the head of academic um, enrichment uh, while I was there. You no, know, I leaned on them heavily. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, Mark Smith, who was the weightlifting coach at the time. And when I had those decisions that I needed to make, um, make a stance, I would go to them for the older perspective. Um, you know, how do you deal with decisions that we're, we're trying to make? Uh, and then too, just my teammates, man. I can't tell you how many thoughtful teammates that I had that when we wanted to make a decision on whatever it was that I could lean, in, lean into them. And you said this earlier, Tamarcus said this earlier, you know, I had a great relationship with uh, Pastiz and still do now. He's, he's one of my mentors. And so he came in my junior year and then we start building from there. And so once I established that relationship with him, you know, that grew into many more opportunities for, um, for me to push um, activism specifically after the time I was at USC because things start picking up. But again, my time um, as a university, at the University of uh, Board of Visitors, um, when the Charleston 9 happened, mm -hmm. um, I was so upset as everyone was um, because you know, it is what it is. But we had a joint meeting um, with the Board of Trustees and the Board of Visitors that day. And everybody was saying the same thing. We're going to figure out how we're going to you know, tackle this. And going into that meeting, I had a feeling that that was going to be the case, that it wasn't going to be any kind of concrete steps coming from the institution of the University of South Carolina with this tragic, um, this tragic um, incident that happened down in Charleston. And so in my mind, I was preparing myself, well, Mo, what you going to do if you hear these leaders who has all this power to do something uh, not provide any answers uh, and talking about where you go about tact, right? So I went through this, listened to everything, got to the conclusion, and they asked, did anybody have anything else to say? I raised my hand. You don't suppose to speak. Um, Chuck Allen, he saw me. I said, I think I saw somebody raise a hand. And I stood up and I spoke my feelings and my emotions, and I challenged everyone. But the way I did it went from anger. It was like, we, we got to be better than this. We're the University of South Carolina. Here I am, 27 years old at the time, I believe, you know, standing in front of the Board of Trustees, being able to have an audience and say, let's do that. We got to be better than this. And then USC went on to be the first institution to call for the downing of the flag. You know, so that was a, that was a way I was being strategic about going and saying how activists can potentially hurt or help me. And in that decision, I knew speaking up could have hurt me, but it didn't matter to me at that point. I was gonna do it professionally. I was gonna try to go about it, do the best way, express my feelings and challenge folks. And what happened after that, you know, I would dealt with it because the stand to stand um, requires courage, um, but it also requires everything that Dunn said. And I won't step back on her feet because it was so beautifully said, yeah. um, but yes, you have to be conscious you have to be conscious of uh, the decision that you're making, not only in activism, but all of them, making sure that it's lining up in, in your professional and personal goals. 
well said as well. So, Marcus, anything to add before I close out with the last question? To be honest, Don and Mo had some great points there. I, I can't even, I can't talk what they said, but you do, you do got to be strategic about what you do now, all right? And you got, and you got to be conscious about it, all right? You can't, you can't make a fool out of yourself. Mm-hmm. And now you, and now you be like an idiot, mm-hmm. all right? You got to be smart about what you do because it's about how people view you. Yes, fight for what you stand for. But don't, but don't make yourself go into that negative light where they don't even show you attention anymore. Mm-hmm. So like Don and Mo said, you got to be strategic about it. And, you know, and once you make that decision, you got to stand strong on it. Stand firm and move forward. Awesome. Well, first and foremost, thank you all again for not just a great conversation, but um, great community over the last you know, 70 or so minutes. Uh, we have one more question, but I want to um, continue to not just say thank you to you all, but again, thank you to our alumni association, in particular, the University of South Carolina Black Alumni Council, uh, because as I started this conversation up today, like it's not normal for alumni councils in athletics to be joined um, in this way. I'm um, so doing so, I hope can continue to be a tradition, continue to be the norm for us as we move throughout this year, but also in future decades as well. Um, so we'll start with Tamarcus, move to Elena, and then Mo and Don for this last question. Um, but what words of wisdom or advice do you have uh, for your fellow U- University of South Carolina Black alumni? Uh, but secondly, how can we collectively best support current and former student athletes? Um, so I'll start with Tamarcus and then move to Elena before Mo and then Don will close out. All right, my best advice, take advantage of education. All right, sports does not last forever. Please take advantage of, of obtaining knowledge and to enhance their knowledge. So that when you do have a conversation later on in the future, when you do have interviews, when you do have discussion like we have, and you have the knowledge to speak on it, you know most ki- most kids they don't they don't take advantage they don't take advantage of education because they're so wrapped on sports and sports don't even last forever. If that makes sense. And so that's that's my words of wisdom. And what's the second thing you asked? Yep. How can we be- how can we collectively best support both current and former student athletes? By just by continue giving us our support, you know, if as a little kid you look to your mom and dad, you look to your mom and dad for their support. Like when you playing a game, you look to the left, you see your mom and dad, and that that's that's what makes you happy. And so for kids, they need to under, they need to know that they got support from the older from older individuals like ourselves that we support their decisions, that we support their voices, that we support anything they do. Because we, they are, they are the future generation of us, um, of our community, man. They're going to be the leaders in the future, and they need, they need the guidance, they need the support. I mean, going by life, you got to have confidence. If you don't got that confidence and support, it's, man, it's just it's kind of hard to make it. So I feel like, as older, as the older crowd, we give our younger and our alumni more support. And whatever they um, whatever their future endeavors are. Thank you, Elena. Okay, so for my advice, I would definitely tell them like, if like a, even if a string of failures come your way or things just aren't like going your way, like don't give up, don't get frustrated, like don't kick yourself when you're down because at the end of the day, like yeah, it seems like things are tough right now, but it's going to get better. And that's speaking from personal experience. Like, like I dropped the number two right now. And well, back in 2017 and right now, I don't know if I'm gonna be playing with anybody, but I'm not letting my spirits keep me down. Like I'm staying up, I'm gonna keep working. So my things for others would just be like, it doesn't matter where you are in your career, as long as you're still doing what you love, the place that you want to get to is going to take time, but just keep working for it. And one day you're going to get it. And what was the second, uh, what was the second part? Nope. Uh, how can we best support both current and former student athletes? Um, I mean, shoot, I think, you know, just by boosting them up on like our social medias, you know, if you see something and like say you're on Twitter and there's an article about say the women's basketball team, you know, quick little retweet, retweet like boost them up, things like that. You know, and even, I mean, I understand COVID's kind of bad right now, but 
you know, if it's a sport you're really passionate about or if it's a team that you really like to go see, try to catch a game. Like, that's the best way that you can be supportive, you know. And even, you know, as as small of a thing that it may be, but like even just watching a game through the TV, like I know when we couldn't necessarily like have fans in the bubble, it sucked. But the fact that they could watch the games and stuff, mm -hmm. it just made it better. So those are my things. Awesome. Thank you, Elena. Uh, Tamo. Um, you know, I, I, again, thank you for having us here tonight. This has been a fantastic conversation. I've enjoyed, enjoyed everyone's perspective, which has been fantastic. Saw Rick Wade uh, talking about talking about mentors. Uh, Rick is a great mentor of mine. I, I met him post uh, graduation at a, a groundbreaking event in um, uh, Greer. BMW was suspending, and we connected. And rest is history. Uh, so, what's up, Rick? Um, for as uh, communication with, uh, excuse me, advice to uh, student athletes that's currently there, understand everything's a process, right? You know, everything's a process. You know, if you look at your season, whatever season is, you have the off season. Um, then you train, 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 go through whatever camp that you have, and then you go into the season, and you play your games, and you go back again. You know, everything's a process, and it never stops. And so, don't get down on yourself. But also in that process, make sure that you're being strategic in how you're taking advantage of the opportunity that you have. I mean, you have the University of South Carolina. Um, the University of South Carolina had literally touches all four corners of this earth. Um, I've been loving the highlights of, of, of Black uh, alumni that has achieved highly from this university. Well, that stands uh, even beyond that. Uh, so understand that you have a window of three to five years um, here or three to five years here at this university to really maximize the platform that you have by being a student athlete and the people that want to connect with you, whether that's your professional prof uh, professors, um, whether that's your uh, other students, whether that's, uh, you know, donors, whether that's just uh, 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 community, um, understand that you got to connect with those folks as best you can. And this is a nugget that I always say, you're always on the interview. You never know who is looking to you, looking at you, talking to you, um, that could potentially put you in a position that can better yourself. Um, the second part of the question of what can we do uh, to help student athletes, we gotta be present. You know, we gotta be present. You know, mm -hmm. we have to show, um, we have to show them the opportunities that they have because in the black community, exposure is, is partly uh, why we don't have as much as success that we have. Um, Cause we haven't seen the folks that come in here that don't have a, a jersey on, but has a suit on or has a hard hat on that can show a great life that goes beyond the football field or whatever sport that you have. Cause we know that on a very small percentage of all elite athletes, if you come to the SEC and you play in whatever sport you, you are an elite athlete, but even in that one to 2% of us are going to go pro. Right. And so we got to make sure that us as an alumni base is staying connected mm -hmm. and catching these great, uh, great athletes and great talented folks and making sure that they're starting their lives and careers off in the right way. And that our Gamecock family, when we say GC for life is exactly that. And we're supporting each other all the way through. Well said Mo, and last certainly not least, uh, Don. Well, I agree with what everyone had to say. Thank you so much for having me on the panel tonight. I really enjoyed um, meeting and reconnecting with some of the um, Gamecocks. And um, I think for the alumni, I would encourage all of our alumni, whether you were graduated in the 50s, 60s, 70s, or you graduated yesterday, I would encourage you to be involved in any kind of mentorships that you can. Like, you know, I could mentor someone who just graduated and I need someone to mentor me. And I think, you know, we can all learn from each other. You can mentor both up and down. And to the student athletes and all of our alum, I would say like, I wish I had done a better job of um, creating relationships across different teams mm -hmm. with different players, um, different, because when you're at the University of South Carolina, I remember there being players from different parts of the country, different parts of the world. I mean, it's like a global brand. And you think about where you can make a connection, you can get a job in Paris, France, because you played, you know, you were um, um, friends with someone on a different team than you. So I would say make those connections and nurture those um, connections and relationships. That's really, really important. And to every student athlete right now, I tell my kids this all the time now, just be, this is my favorite quote, be so good, they can't ignore you. And that's with everything. That's in the classroom, that's on the track, that's when you go into the training room, when you're in the weight room, when you're doing your warm up, your prep, just continue to be so good that no one can ignore you and that what is coming for you will find you. 
if I don't say I if, if I don't say this, I, I you know, as a former president of Association of Letterman, I'll probably not be able to go back into the Letters and Lounge. Join the Association of Letterman. Um, that is your key con contact after life after uh, after sports here. Um, Association of Letterman. If you look it up, USC Association of Letterman. Um, you're you're gonna be a member of it, but it's a paid membership. You're gonna get the correspondence. Make sure that you're connected there. Um, you get a lot of great information and how you can stay connected as student athlete. So had to make that plug. Don, no, were you, you have something else to say, Don? No, that was it. That was just that was the end. I just want I just want athletes to take advantage. Like everyone said, just take advantage of you, where you are right now. Just take advantage of it day by day, because um, it will follow you. I mean take full advantage of it now because it will follow you. I've graduated 25 years ago and I'm still getting calls as, you know, Dawn Ellerby, the Gamecock or Dawn Ellerby, who was an Olympian. I'm still getting those calls. So sports is a big part of your life. So just take full advantage of it right now. It will follow you. Dawn, did I cut you off? No, you didn't. Oh, I thought, I thought you were good. I'm about to say my bad. <laughs> might, might be my internet. No, I'm not saying I don't got trouble. I'm not mad at it. Uh, the Houston Association of Lettermen should be very happy that you're a member. <laughs> awesome. So for everyone else, like, just put uh, the University of South Carolina Black Alumni Council Instagram handle in the chat. So please engage with us, follow us. Uh, we'll post all of our updates and alerts on that page. Um, again, I want to highlight the team that helped make this possible. So Amber Guy and my co-chair. Shayla Merritt, uh, Simone Chardonnay, I'm um, Stephen Nicholson, uh, who was involved with Indianapolis Gamecocks, uh, who brought this idea to the Black Alumni Council. So Stephen, again, thank you for your leadership and inspiration for this to happen. Uh, but to Marcus, Elena, Don, Mo, hope to see y'all in South Carolina, hopefully at a game, some competition this fall. Um, if not, we'd love to connect with y'all uh, remotely and virtually as well. Uh, for everyone else, uh, thank you and good night. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.